We're all set. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, welcome to uh, a session on adult faith formation or, or doing adult faith formation for every adult in your community. Uh, my name is John Roberto. Um, I, I guess I could say I work at Lifelong Faith Associates, except that I'm the only staff member at Lifelong Faith Associates, so the whole staff is here today. Um, and this is the uh, fifth E-formation. I was able to be here the very first time, and it's been a, watching the program grow. Um, I work in Lifelong Faith Formation really all across the country. Um, and this, this presentation especially has grown out of work I've done the last five or six years about rethinking the way we do or reimagining faith formation. Um, so let me give you a couple of preliminaries, then we're going to kind of dive in. Um, I put on my website, lifelongfaith.com, in addition to the, pres to the presentations, um, there's also an article you can download called Strategies for Developing Adult Faith Formation. I'm going to do some of them in the presentation so you can download it. So you don't have to worry about taking notes because you've got the PowerPoint. you got the just take your own personal notes. Um, the other thing is also um, feel free to ask questions as we go. All right, don't wait to the end, okay, because we'll just go right to the end usually. So ask questions as we go. Um, second site I want to, to mention, I'm going to refer to this. Um, people ask me a lot of times when you're talking about this vision of adult faith formation, what does it look like? And so I'm going to refer a little while to the website called Seasons of Adult Faith Formation, um, which is an example of what I'm going to try to do. So you can get to all of this just by going to these buttons and clicking on those in the Lifelong Faith website. So that gives you the background stuff. Okay, let's begin. By way of background, at least as I've traveled you know, four plus decades, it's very rare that I find a church in which adult faith formation is the strongest element of their faith formation. Would that be a safe statement? Okay. Um, it, 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 well, the real world, it's just very, it's rarely the, the, the strongest part of what they do. Um, part of that is the challenge of now, how do you address seven decades of the life cycle? Everybody over 20 years old, okay? Um, if we distributed resources, programming, and strategies evenly across the life cycle, um, we would certainly have a lot more to spare for the seventh tenths of the life cycle, seven decades, than we do in the first couple of decades. So how do we think about adult faith, faith formation in a new way um, with all of the generations and, and the life cycle? So um, what I want to look at is there are ways today where you have this kind of convergence of this new ways of thinking about faith formation and the huge challenges we face in dealing with young adults, midlife adults, mature adults, and older adults. So we at least have four different seasons, if you will, of adults. How does a church do, really do a faith formation across that whole range of people? So a couple of the resources you'll find online. Um, I have some copies of the book that we did on just this. Uh, there's a couple of free journal articles on adult faith formation. Um, you can download those, get those uh, for yourself. Um, I'll get back to that, the website. In October um, of 2015, uh, we had a symposium, Lifelong Faith does a symposium every year. Um, this one was on adult faith formation. And the focus of the symposium was this question, what could adult faith formation in faith communities look like in five years, 2016 to 2020? Um, and part of the goal was to say, how do we reimagine adult faith formation with the needs, interests, faith and spiritual journeys of adults today and the new opportunities we have? So. We're looking at those seven, basically seven, eight decades, how do we shape faith formation? And in a, we did a process called the scenario process. You can download this, the whole, the whole description of it. But basically what I want to say is, how do we imagine what faith formation could look like? And so we used, with a, we had 105 people who engaged in this process. Basically to say, every scenario is built around um, uncertainties, things we don't know. And so we asked people to identify what were some of the things about adults that we need to be aware of in both the world in which adults live and within the lives of adults. So we had three big tensions, if you will, in terms of the world of adults. First, the diversity in society. Adults are dramatically diverse. Um, and how faith communities respond to that diversity. 
Some faith communities resist that diversity. Some faith communities embrace that diversity. But we won't do any testimonies of where your churches are on these continuums. The second way, Carol, is that adults are busy, stressed, time crunched, and overwhelmed. Okay. And the response of churches of that is, we just continue to do business as usual. Okay. We do our four-week Lenten series. It's Wednesday night, 7.30 to 9. We've done it for 400 years. We're going to continue doing it that time. Or we're responsive and innovative, and churches are along that continuum. And the third one was, which was fascinating, was a design your own life culture. Okay. Out of all the available options you have for identities, design your own life. And what, how do churches respond to that? Well, we've all been in communities in which it's a standardized, one-size-fits-all adult faith formation. If it matches, you're good. Or customizing adult faith formation where one-size-fits-one. So we had those three choices about the world, and then we had these kind of adults. You may know some of them. Um, adult desire and interest for developing their spiritual life. One of the tensions was, is it decreasing or increasing? Their openness to belonging or participating in a faith community. Was that decreasing or increasing? And then third, the adult desire and interest and hunger in being engaged. Was that decreasing and increasing? And we asked the group to select what they thought were the two biggest uncertainties that they faced, and they chose these. The way in which churches or faith communities embraced or resisted the diversity in the adult life experience. And then secondly, the adult's desire and interest in spiritual life decreasing or increasing. They thought those two variables, uncertainties, would make a huge difference in the way you thought about adult faith formation. So consequently, what you develop are these four scenarios. And these can prove really helpful in kind of naming your situation, okay? That's, they're, they're not predictive, they're descriptive. So you say, what, who are the adults or what kind of church are we? Because as I've done this with groups, it really unlocks why people are struggling or why they're succeeding. So up in the right corner, everybody wants this church and these adults, okay? This is the community that embraces the diversity. Yes, we have, we have adults across these seven decades of life. Those adults represent all kinds of diversities in their spiritual journeys, their religious journey, their, their needs, their hungers, their interests. And those adults have a desire to grow. In the bottom right, the consistent part is the adult's desire and growth, but we work in a faith community that kind of resists that diversity. So how do we get adults to continue to come to the things that we've always done, even though their, their hungers are much wider, much more diverse? So on the right side, the adult interest is high. On the left side, the left two scenarios, adult interest is lower. So we always, see, always, when you do the four scenarios, you always have what we call a doomsday scenario, all right? The doomsday one is number three, and that is the faith communities resist the diversity and the adults don't wanna grow. So the suggestion to anybody who's in that church, time for a new job. Not really, I'll give you some strategies. But you can take a look at that and say, well that just kind of names, well how do you work in a church which resists the diversity of the adult life experience, and which adults just really are not interested in growing spiritually. They're too busy, they're too overwhelmed, they're too fill in the blank. And then scenario four over the left corner, the faith communities are embracing that diversity, but it's the adults who just simply are not interested in growing and developing. So we've got, a, we've got the right kind of community, the right kind of staff, how do we engage with these adults? Because they're overwhelmed, et cetera, et cetera. So if you look through your church through those four lenses, it becomes pretty interesting to say, what kind of community are we and what kind of adults do we have? Now, you can't be a community that's a one and a three. All right. You can be a one and a two, meaning what? The community is engaging, but we have a diversity of adults from interested to eh, not so much, okay? Or across the top, a one and a four, where the adult, I'm sorry, um, where you have adult is, uh, desires, a faith community is embracing, but the adults are different, or the adults are different, but your community is different. 
So, and then you have number three, which is, I need to move. Um, so we've used this, these four scenarios as a way to kind of describe, well, then what strategies develop? So, so our response is, how, do you, how can you be responsive to this diversity of the adult experience and the stance our community is taking? Let me stop, I have these described in here. Questions on the scenario piece, because I'm gonna use that as a lens to think about how we do adult faith formation. In your assessment, a picture, a description of, of the different decrease and increase in adult desire. I mean, I can look programmatically and see, are we offering diversity of programming? Right. But how do you, the, that population is much bigger, much more individualized. How do you, how do you assess that? Do you assess that? Um, the, easy, the simplest and easiest way is to, to get close to the diversity of people. So you've got adults with high spiritual interest in the rest, and you could probably do anything with these folks. But so when I'm working with churches and they're building this out, I'll say, do some focus groups. Spend 45 minutes or an hour with group asking, and the, you, I've got them online as well, asking them kind of questions about what are your needs, what are your hungers, what do you, want, what do you see our church doing, et cetera. But then take those focus groups and spread them across different segments, okay? So, for example, I could meet at church with different focus groups of people interested, but I better be able to meet out in the community with other groups that have nothing to do with church, but they're, but they're, part, they're connected in some way, shape, or form. Um, so if you can vary the ways in which you gather information about people, very few churches do this, okay? And, and surveys are okay, but you know the only people who are going to fill out a survey are adults who are interested, okay? So you kind of self-select who's gonna do the survey, you know, so, and you, that's why people say, well, I could, have, I could have guessed that's what was gonna come out in the survey. Well, of course, those are the people you work with, okay? It's the, it's the other three quarters, so to speak, of adults that I need to figure out who are my adults who are four time a year adults, occasionals. Who are some of my adults who we see for special life cycle moments, milestones, but are a little bit more spiritual but not religious? Who are the adults who just can't get to church, older adults, who I need to visit? See, if you think about the whole community as your, as your campus, there's lots of adults that you can be serving, but they don't have any input into the ways in which we think about adult faith formation. That's why that from one size fits all to one, to one size fits one mindset is an important mindset and how our response is. So my, I just think if you had a team of eight or 10 people and you just became anthropologists for a couple of months and just listen to people and observe people, you get a sense of what this diversity looks like. The other thing is you start trying different initiatives that, that span, the, span your audience and then see who responds. The best survey is by doing a variety of different activities, programs, initiatives. And then you kind of say, well, this really has some traction, this not so much. And then evaluate. We're, we don't do very well on the front end, but we also don't do very well on the back end, which is how do people experience this and what now do they want? So those two pieces, we do pretty well in the designing programming. We'll get more of that in a minute. But it's the uh, Stanford School of Design calls it human-centered design, is you start with people. And, and you get close to them through observation, through focus groups, and through, if you want, surveys. But I would do a survey when I had a variety of things working and use the survey as kind of both evaluation and interest finder. I wouldn't lead with a survey because, it, because you just know who's gonna fill it out initially. Any effort to get off the church campus with your data collection is helpful. And everybody knows somebody who used to be a member of your church. That's very, it's not hard to find folks. So sometimes people say, well, how would I ever find a spiritual not religious? And I always, well, let's say they're 20 and 30 somethings. I always say their grandmas and grandpas are at church. Their moms and dads are at church on Sunday. So you have an easy access to people when you're brought on your campus. That, that's kind of, and by the way, I wouldn't do that as a massive thing. I would just do that, you know, fold it into the way you think about it. But I always try to proceed planning in this model with some focus groups, just listen to people. And you also have to break up the adult experience. It's very hard to plan adult faith formation from 20 to 90s. So you can target different seasons or you can group matures and older. 
because at different stages of their life, it's easier to think about initiatives, projects, activities, ways to engage them. Oh, sure. Yeah, I'll do that. In this model? No, how, we, how do we define uh, communities? Um, no, I'm, I'm really looking at the whole faith community and the scenarios, but saying that you may need to target particular age groups when you get to that point of planning. But I wanna hear from the whole adult spectrum. So I wanna, I wanna gather a lot of data, and then depending on the size of my community, and I'll get to that in a few minutes, I can target particular sections of that community. That, was that an answer that helped? Go ahead. Stay with it because we can because you'll see some practical application in a few minutes. In this kind of analysis, uh, the solution may be e delivery of content, or it might be live education yeah. and seminar and so. Forth. So the question is, what kind of what does this mean for delivery of faith formation? And that's and that's the key. So once you kind of name. In broad strokes, this is the kind of community. I've got a community that kind of resists spreading out. It's very hard to get beyond the four walls of the church out to the real world of adults, okay? So how do I approach that kind of church strategically? Because I have adults who are interested and there's desire, okay? So once you kind of name that, instead of getting frustrated, I tailor my strategies to that kind of church. And that kind of church is going to look a lot different than a church in one, four, or three. So what I encounter a lot is because we, in adult faith formation more than any other place, we just take it as one big hunk. And it's not. We have to differentiate it. We have to be a little more nuanced about it. And we have to be more strategic. So when people say, we have adult faith formation, we adopted this program. Oh, so whether, whether it's adult Bible study or adult renewal or not, you know what's going to happen. You get a slice of people, and then there's lots who squish out the sides that you don't address. That means, doesn't mean I won't do the program, but I need to be more strategic. So this is a lens for being strategic. Does that make sense? Okay, stay with that because I'm going to play those out. Okay, I just, in the PowerPoint, I described each of these. I'm not going to do this here, so you can read those in the PowerPoint. So if I was in a church that was in a scenario one and two, so those are the two scenarios on the right, in which I have adult interest, but my community is variable. So I have a community that embraces or the community that resists. Part of what I need to do, and he's like, you can't interview everybody. Part of what I need to do is I need to offer a wide diversity to catch as many people as I can in as many different ways as I can. So part of my strategy for one and two is broaden out the faith formation possibilities. Now, if we're doing this workshop 15 years ago, you would say, well, how many programs can I run? Ah, this is 2016. The question changes. How do I address people's needs with as many different opportunities as I can? Not programs. So I'm working with a church. They've done adult Bible studies for 100 years. Sunday morning between the 8 o'clock worship service, 11 o'clock worship service. You may know a church like this. Big church. Okay. And so I'm doing this kind of a workshop, and their question to me is, how do we get more adults, especially younger ones, to our Bible studies from 9.30 to 10.30 on Sunday morning? The problem is the question is fundamentally wrong. The question is, how do I engage young adults with the Bible? Not how I get them there at 9.30. So I said, well, how, like how many years have the adults who've been, Dubai, been doing it? Oh, we've had groups going on for 20 or 30 years. So what's the chance a 28-year-old is going to fit his or her way into a group of grandmas and grandpas who have grown up with each other for the last 100 years? Slim to nil. And then I said to them, well, how many young adults are up at 9.30 on Sunday morning? Or... If you don't go to the 8 o'clock worship or the 11 o'clock worship, what's the chance you're going to come to the 930 Bible study? It just was the wrong question, but it's the question we normally ask. 
how do we get them to our one size fits all Bible study? We don't quite say it that way, but you see what I'm driving at. Okay. The response to it to, to in this world where you have a church that wants to embrace the diversity is then offer diversity and worry less about where the adults are and just assume they're across the whole spectrum from actively engaged to not affiliated, but they're out there in our community. We should serve all of them. This is the big mindset shift. All the adults in our community are right for adult faith formation, whether they come to worship on Sunday or not, whether they know they're right for faith formation or not. We just will assume that. So scenario one and two, Communities embracing. Back in the 1970s, Malcolm Knowles, you might know that name. Malcolm Knowles was the founder, in a sense, of modern adult education. And he had this diagram in a 1970s book called The Adult Learner. And I was taken by it way back in 75, which, of course, is 100 years ago, back in the analog world. All right. And he talked about, and this is all physical, all right? He talked about creating learning communities. Does this, does this resonate a bit? Okay. Where you had educational planning consultants and educational diagnosticians. I love that word. I want to be an educational diagnostician when I grow up. With a lifelong learning resource center. And this was a roadmap for a community developing adult continuing education. Not churches, but the whole community. And then all these organizations, media, religious institutions, labor unions, trade associations, libraries, factories, were all part of this integrated learning community. Now, in 75, that was bricks and mortar. In 2016, it's digital and bricks and mortar. So what happens is you can actually realize this vision today, this network. So we wouldn't call it a learning community. We'd call it a network of learning experiences. You can now realize that network today because we can build it in a digital way and we have access to all these digital resources. So far, so good? So if I have a community that embraces the diversity of adult experience and says, we have a mission to do adult faith formation with every single adult in our community. You can do it today. You can do it today. Because it's not about bricks and mortar anymore. The whole community is adult faith formation. So I'm doing a workshop on adult faith formation in the, in the Catholic Archdiocese of New York. I'm a Roman Catholic. And I'm presenting this model. People say, how will we ever do that? Now, I'm in Manhattan. How do we ever do this? You know, I said, well, imagine getting a group of adults who just want to spend a day looking at religious art at the Metropolitan Museum. And then over a meal or a cup of coffee. Yeah, I'm not talking about a church program. Oh, I said, you can go over to the American Bible Society Museum of Biblical Archaeology when it was in New York. And, and, you can, and you can spend the whole day there. That's adult faith formation. But the old understanding of adult faith formation was what? Run a class, do a Bible study. But not see the whole community as my educational resource. When you take that view, even if you're in a small town in the middle of, in quotes, nowhere, in the digital world, no one's nowhere. So, What's the key in thinking about adult faith formation as a network? First, you have to have a lot of variety. Whether you're small or big doesn't make any difference anymore. The smallest churches online can look huge. Whether you spell that with an H or a Y. <laughs> Bernie Sanders, huge. All right. But you have, you have to offer variety because in scenario one and two, Adult, the community wants to embrace the diversity and you've got all these adults. So you have to offer them lots of different opportunities in different places and settings and the rest. So first variety based around the adults. Second, it has to be responsive to where they are spiritually. Everything can't be a graduate theology course. Where's all the varieties along that continuum from 
first steps to PhD. Third, it's got to be in multiple environments today. Self-directed, mentored, at home, in small groups, in large groups, church-wide, intergenerational, and out in the community, in the workplace, and out in the world. So once you open, like, what, what this is doing is, you were once a painter painting on an eight and a half by 11 canvas. I've now given you the whole wall to do a mural. That's the shift. That's the shift. Everybody can do this. Every church in America could do this. You just got to change the mindset. Sure. Right. Okay, so the question is, how do we get credit for this? The answer is almost self-evident. You're the matchmaker. You can sing the song if you want from Fiddler on the Roof, but you're the matchmaker. You're matching. You're the one who knows your people. And as an education, it's going to come back, diagnostician, you're matching people to opportunities. And so your community becomes a hub of this broader faith-forming community of learning. You become the go-to place. In other words, if this was easy to do, anybody can just Google this stuff. You can't Google it. You have to curate it. It has to be selected. It has to be matched. It has to be contextualized. So you know your people. That's your greatest asset. Because not, there's tons of content. When I started in ministry 47 years ago, there was a real lack, a scarcity of any kind of content. This is the old print days. Today, it's an abundance of content in all different forms. So that's no longer our problem is curriculum or content, video, audio. We have tons of it. It's matchmaking. Needs, resources. That's, your, that, that's what the university is not doing. That's what Google can't do. But you can do it. I don't mean personally, but I mean as a community. But personally, too. And then we can be digitally enabled and digitally connected and online. This is the game changer. Because while the other three would have been true in the analog world, this is true in the digital world. And so if you go right to left, you'll see all the digital possibilities. And I'm going to concentrate, you know, kind of my second one over the line one. Every program can be extended using digital tools. Sunday worship, Bible study, guest presenter, all that stuff can be extended. So that now reaches a wider audience. So if you're not there on 7.30 on Wednesday night, you can access it on Sunday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon because you video recorded it. You know how much content a typical church generates in a year? You know how much it saves? Nada. Because we're on the model that if you don't come, you can't get it. If that was true of TED Talks, there'd be no TED Talks. There would have been things that happened in Monterey, California that would never have gotten recorded. We can flip the classroom. Well, in adult faith formation, flip the Bible study. Flip marriage preparation. You can do all kinds of things in which people learn online and then come for a gathered experience to process, discuss, and apply it. You can take things and, and, and variate them. We'll gather, you'll learn online. We'll gather, you'll learn online, we'll gather. So we reduce the burden of people having to adjust their schedules to us, but we still have face-to-face -face gathered settings. So it's, it's the blending of those. And then think about all we can do that's just fully online. And the resources we now have access to, courses, and you've got the general drift. So it becomes relatively easy, I'm gonna go ahead a little bit. It becomes rel relatively easy to think, what would an adult faith formation network look like with each of these pods or nodes having rich content and experiences? And what would it be like to think about programming 
on a seasonal basis, including the summer. See, as long once you get once you get away from the bricks and mortar mindset and realize it's only one setting, there's multiple, then we can take faith formation on the go. We can, wherever you go, we go with you. Imagine if St. Paul had this technology. See what I mean? So I'm gonna, I'm, I'm actually gonna take a break. I wanna show you what this looks like, okay? So in workshops, I, did, I, I, I created a fictional church called Holy Trinity Adults, a Holy Trinity Church where I'm the pastor and staff and membership, uh, all rolled into one. I actually have people sign up for workshops, by the way, which is kind of, I don't even, I can't, I don't need the heart to write back to them and say, it's just make believe. I mean, you can't, I'm not actually doing the webinar. But what I've done is, um, I wanted to show you how you put, pull all this together. So I've taken, this and you can you can access it now on the seasons of adult faith formation site so let me just show you what what you can do and how possible this is okay when you go home or later today and you go to the seasons of adult faith formation all right so this is the website this this I had to move from Holy Trinity Adults to something more generic. And so this is the name of the book, so I moved it. So a network of faith formation experiences, programs, activities, and resources. And it explains that it's just a demonstration site. But now imagine thinking about faith formation as a series of playlists. We're all used to it. iTunes, Spotify, the rest. Everyone creates their playlist. Well, what's really happening in education is that the most creative educators are now thinking about how to create playlists. We used to call them in the old days individualized learning units or whatever we used to call it, right? How do we create playlists from which students can select the activities that best address their intelligences, their activity, but it's still substantive content. So here's a dozen ways to learn math or this unit in math, okay, algebra or whatever, but pick the one that best engages you. <laughs> So what I've done is simply say, what if you thought about a digital platform called a website, but it's a faith formation, not a church website, not a church website, a learning website that has rich content in it, built around your adults in, in a community that embraces diversity and has adults all across the spectrum. And you create a playlist of content and experiences, audio, video, and the rest, that can be done in a variety of different ways. And you curated the best content. So I don't have a real church, but at a real church, I take my existing programming and integrate that into my digital platform. And then three times a year, I'd offer new programming. Obviously, some would be continuing, but some would be new. So, I've organized this. This is so doable, by the way. If an old 66-year-old guy can do it, you can do it. So across the top, those menus are my big circles on my network. Adult living, adult issues, milestones, transitions. Discovering faith for those who are the initial steps of the journey. Faith enrichment, scripture enrichment, seasons of the year, both church and calendar. Ser service, spiritual life, and Sunday worship. So they're, they're pretty recognizable, okay? So there's no secret to how to... And then around those, I created playlists of activities, experiences that people can do in a large group, in a small group, on their own, online, in person, with a mentor. You see where I'm going with this. I just want to expand the possibilities. So far, so good? Don't glaze over on me. Thank God this is the first workshop in the morning, not the last. <laughs> and then again, seasons, service, spiritual life, and worship. Let me do a couple examples. So how do you manage this is the question. Now imagine my adult faith formation team 
which is out there, who's tired of setting up tables and chairs and serving coffee, would like to move on to something bigger, all right? So take, oops, I can get higher enough. So take the big content, I don't want Firefox. <laughs> So take the menu items, and if I worked as a team, I could have a team of curators working together. Think of yourself as an editorial board, and we're all responsible for different areas of the website. Now, I'm only gonna do three updates a year, so that's, I can get into a cycle, okay? So once I get into that cycle, I've got somebody who just is managing scripture. They're looking ahead, so I'm, right now, we're in the summer season, they're looking ahead for fall content, which will upload September 1. I can manage my adult team. I'm only gonna go to, I'm, for curating, I'm gonna go to selected, um, uh, well done, high quality sites to begin with. So you never Google things, you go to your trusted sites for resources. But I have somebody work in scripture, I have somebody else work in spirituality. So when our team gathers, it's like an editorial board meeting. What will we select, put on, design? One of us has to be you know, under 60 so that we can, somebody can manage the website. This is simply built on Weebly, W-E-E-B-L-Y.com. Simple, I designed it. It's very easy tools, a drag and drop. But when you look at this, so Sunday worship. So we get the, the pastor engaged with us to say, here's what's coming. We use the revised common or the Catholic lectionary, the narrative lectionary, we use a sermon series. So how will I start to think about that? I worked with a church in Connecticut where I live that was moving to, they want to do a whole year long, whole church approach to faith formation. And it was starting, it was going to be a sermon series each month around a Christian practice. Well, we built a website that reflected that. So there's activities for the home, for adults, for children and youth, all managed by different people, but the focusing theme, the worship, and the sermon is the guiding principle for selecting content. Same thing here. So this is where you really do have an adult faith formation team, okay? And it, 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 some churches I work with, it's all volunteers. And so I point them to the kinds of good resources that are out there and how to find those resources. But they know, when you know your adult and you know your community, this becomes easy because the content's out there. And even though you see, I'll have a lot of content, it's not about the quantity, it is about the quality and the responsiveness to the adult's experience. It's very, very doable. And the other thing is, it's not about what you're losing. Is you take that four week Lenten series and you simply incorporate it into this bigger, bigger framework. So you don't lose, it's not about stopping adult Bible study because eight people come. You keep doing it, but you don't only do it. To what degree do you see this working at Connecticut churches in local areas, you know, uh, pointing each other to each other? Yeah. Uh, the question is, to what degree do we see this kind of working ecumenically? So if you look at those areas up there, there's, like, Sunday worship is going to be particular to every church. But if you hit Sunday worship, it could say, St. Blank, Holy Something, First Church, and you just click on that button to get this Sunday's worship. But you move over to, to let's say, uh, spiritual life. Well, it's something we could do across the board. So things that are more what I'll call tradition bound to your tradition, you do those uniquely. Things that can be done ecumenically, especially when you talk about mainline Roman Catholic, okay? We have a lot of consistency theologically and, and we share this, a lot of the same resources. You can do that really across the board, even faith enrichment. So it's easier within one tradition. So I was working with six small Presbyterian churches doing the same kind of thing. And of course these six pastors looked at me saying, you have to be kidding. I said, I'm not. Why don't you think of yourselves as one church, one website? What if you gathered quarterly to update this? What if you, you co-branded it? So across the bottom are your logos or pictures of the church. And then you shared all that content. So it's really hard to, because of geography in a rural area. It's really hard for you to travel around for all these programs. But 
You could do a shared Lenten series where everybody hosts for once for, for one week in the six weeks of Lent. And if you didn't make it, it's not a problem. We're video recording it. It's going to be online. One website, six curators, lots of shared content, lots of unique content. What's really hard in physical sense, which is working with other churches in terms of physical spaces and fixed time stuff, those problems kind of go away when you go to the digital side. Now, we're not going to lose any of that. That's, that's the point. So it's a both and approach, not an either or approach. But the benefits of thinking digitally about this are just immense. Watch. So let's take spiritual life. Now remember, this is not a real church, but it's, it's what you could put on a real church. So I'll often give this example. We're going to do a five-session weekly program on spiritual practices for living. Everyone's going to love this. Okay? You could do it in Lent. You could do it in the fall. Anytime. It's a fixed time. So you're going to have five presentations. We'll video record it. So if you miss it, you can watch it online. And I have a Catholic example. You use it. That's the Catholic book. And I have a general example. You can use Sacred Rhythms by Haley Ruth Park. So you have a book, real fixed time, real people at church. Everyone's thrilled. But that one program will reach a much wider audience. You could access this as part of your adult faith formation because you can connect to their website. You could be in California. This church could be in Virginia, and you could access their content and put it on your website. Remember what I mentioned before? How much content do you generate each year? How much do you keep? Not anymore. So... That's, that's a physical program. We do programs like that. We're going to continue doing programs like that. But we're going to record them. So if you missed it, we can do it. And if this is good, I can record this. I can write a little study guide. I can encourage people to do small groups at home, at Starbucks, anywhere they want with that same content. I can repurpose that content in a half dozen different ways. So that's why it's not about, i got to offer a million programs. Here's one program I can offer in five different formats. And every time I do that, I'm going to reach more people. One program, multiple formats. And I'm still making people on my finance council thrilled because we're doing something at church. But not only at church. Yes. Questions about small groups. It's a great thing for creating small groups organically. As opposed to, we're going to be a small group church. And you watch people go, oh, here's the newest thing this year. All right? Instead of saying, gather, these are adults. They gather in small groups, and study groups, and book groups all the time. My wife's in three different book groups. Organize yourself. We'll deliver the content. What's not to like? If you can't make us on a Wednesday night, do it on Friday night at your house. Open up a bottle of Chardonnay or Cabernet or your local home brew and enjoy yourself with our content. This is church on the move. What's not to like? The only danger might be that people actually like having a glass of Chardonnay with their, and will want to do that. But it's a happy problem. And you can, and you can still do metrics. Yeah, just how many people, just, they just simply say, we have eight people coming. You just find out. And it becomes part of your report. You have Google Analytics on every website you could add it. It's free. You can do analytics. There's no problem with metrics, even though it doesn't tell you a damn thing, except the people's bodies are there. What you're going to want is what? Stories. Facebook groups where people are talking to each other. Website can't do that, but Facebook can do that. You want photos. You want some video. You can get plenty of input. That's really not the problem. And if you have members then of your faith community who are discovering resources outside, do you have a way for them to bring them to you? Yes. So the question is, when people discover resources, what do you do? 
you bring them to my editorial board and we review them. Make sure they fit in terms of need, content, tradition, appropriateness, that kind of stuff. You always have, the biggest thing about curating is vetting resources, screening them. Because the only things I want up here are things that I believe 100%. Because we have an abundance. You don't have to put so-so content up here. You can put real, it's gotta be really good. This is your, in other words, for some people, this is the first look at your church is going online. Some people who are not there every Sunday, this is, what the, this is how they see church. Is the quality good? Is the design of the website good? This is, people ask, you know, how do you do evangelism? Well, this is a big chunk of doing really good evangelism or evangelization. This is what people are going to see. Do you value quality? Do you value a variety of things that respond to our spiritual needs, et cetera, et cetera? Okay. Sure. I'll give you an example. Just happen to have an example about new members. Okay. So we'll go to Discover Faith. Most of you are familiar with the Alpha program. So I just put Alpha up there. It's kind of like explore life's big questions, join a group, and then we follow up with you. But a pastor, a Lutheran pastor out in Washington State, um, and these are on YouTube. In fact, if you follow the link, you can actually get to the videos. He did a series of short, what he called Bases of Christianity, which was his new member classes. He went out and he recorded them. So you could actually learn about things online. So what he did was, um, you could watch the videos on YouTube. I bet you can watch them on your website too. But on the website is, I'd like to talk to somebody about this. Click, and the email goes to the pastor you see in the video. So for people who don't, oh, I don't know if I want to go to the church, I don't want to approach the pastor, this is kind of a non uh, uh, intrusive, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it's not anticipating, you know, it's not, you're, you're not, you're not overwhelming anybody. It's, you know, I'd like to join a basics of Christianity group. Click and we'll get back to you. So the website is a front is, can be a front door for people to welcome that. This would be under my discover faith. I can make it more prominent. I could do all kinds of things with it, but I have that content. Here's one pastor who's just filmed it. He's got somebody filming him. It's good content, but I would do my own. And behind him is his church. And he actually found a day in Seattle area where it wasn't raining. Yeah, so how do you direct people to good content? Yes, and um, let me remind me before, I'm, I'm going to recommend a variety of things. Remind me before we break, and I'll show you the website, Curating Faith Formation, where I've aggregated some of this content. So I'll just show you now. I won't remember at the end. So I started putting some of this content into a website. Now it's not complete, it's just one effort at it. But I try to put things into categories, so for example, a lot of worship stuff, um, it's ecumenical, and it's just a variety of places that have solid content. Okay? It's not everything, doesn't reflect every denomination, but it's at least a starting point. And I try to describe them a little bit, but with a little sentence or two. So it's places that you can start, it's a starter, okay? I tend not to Google this, because then you spend weeks Lost in the web. How did you get here? I don't know. I asked the question Bible, and I got, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm walking right now through, through Jerusalem, you know, and I how did I gotta get here? You know, I, you know I, somebody's asking me questions in Hebrew. I just, had, what happened, you know? You can, it's, is it true, though? You can get lost, in, um, you know, in Google land. But, so... It's just, it's a good starter, and a lot of the content I put on the Seasons of Adult Faith Formation site is content I like as well. Let me show you. So this is a, it's a good example about basics. Um, 
scripture is a kind of a, how could you not, all right? So, so here's my playlist. No one's going to do all of it, but I'm not worried about people doing all of it. I'd be thrilled if they did one thing for scripture in the fall. Thrilled. I'd be happy if two people took that online course on the Gospel of Mark. Thrilled. Because it's a 200% increase over last year when we didn't offer anything. See, metrics is not how far, how many you got, it's how far you've come. Quarterly Sunday school lesson could easily be put up on here. Anything can be extended from church. So let me do scripture, then I'll come back and I'll do worship, and I'll show you how to how extend things. So what I've done when I, when I did Holy Trinity Adults is say, just focus on what you can't focus on all three Gospels. Just take one in the fall. So uh, let's say the next lectionary cycle is going to be uh, Matthew, all right, starting in, in December, all right? So we can do a Gospel presentation series at church. Three presentations, I'm going to three people in, maybe they're pastors, biblical scholars, whomever. Okay. But of course, I video them. We can do a small group Bible study. We have people who love small group Bible study. Great. We'll do small group Bible study. They can register on the website, all that kind of stuff. They can host their own. So I gave them times, but they're probably all bad. You know, so they can host their own on their own schedule. They can do an online course. For one, just one example, Yale University open courses. Uh, one of the uh, faculty in the religion department has a course on the, on the New Testament. All I did was go to that course. I broke it up into pieces so people can do that on their own. They can go to Luther Seminary's great site called Enter the Bible and just do it on their own. See, they can develop a gospel reading plan using the best-selling free app out there, which is the YouVersion Bible app. Over 220 million people have downloaded it. You're familiar with it. It looks like the cover of a Bible that says simply Holy Bible on it. It's probably on your phones and the rest right now. But they have study plans. So if you dig a little deeper, you notice, notice how much I've created here, right? Nothing. I invited three presenters. I have my high school kids as my film crew. And then I curated great content. And then my job is to what? Promote it, be a matchmaker, engage people. How long is it going to take me to prepare a course on the Gospel of Matthew? How long will it take N.T. Wright? Point made. And then I have a lot of Bible devotions all online that are curated. They're all good. And depending on your tradition, some will be better for a tradition than others. So that's my scripture offerings. I wouldn't do all three Gospels, I'd just do one, but everything else would be, would hold up true. You can do anything, you can do Old Testament, New Testament, it just doesn't make any difference. But you got the general drift of what we're putting together. And there's no copyrighted issue at all, because I'm linking to people's websites where the content is. So I don't take anything onto my site, so there's no copyright. People love when you connect to them. They love you. Why? The more connections, the higher up the Google ladder to heaven you go. <laughs> it's true. So the only time copyright is an issue is when you've taken some other work, which you don't have permission to use, and put it on your website. But that doesn't apply to YouTube videos. Okay? Because you can play a YouTube video on your website, but the video stays on the YouTube site. You've never moved the video. You simply have a player that does that. So it's called embedding. Okay. So people worry about copyright an awful lot. And I say, why? What are you worried about? Who wants to, who wants to spend all the time cutting and pasting content? I grew up in the cut and paste era. Scissors, scotch tape, Xerox machine. You could do ministry. This is, you, don't need to, you don't need to do that. It's all there. I don't need to take, I'd rather them go there, be, part, be surrounded with all this great biblical content, for example, and enter the Bible, and maybe say, huh, I wonder about this. And off they go into web learning. I don't want that content on my site. I want my site to be clean. 
that make sense? Now, what is unique on my site? Let's go to Sunday worship. Here's where I do generate content. So every Sunday, we're putting the sermon, either in audio or video, the scripture readings and a commentary. But that should, that's homegrown. Even if the commentary isn't homegrown, I can link to like working preacher. Some 300,000 people use it every week. That's a lot of the same sermons being given over and over. No, okay. I had one pastor say, I'm not linking to working preacher. They'll know where I get my stuff from. Um, but so that's unique content you generate. Okay. I can do all kinds of stuff with that. And this, this is reading the scriptures. So, for example, the Catholic Bishops Conference has the daily scriptures in audio, video, and print. I'm not going to put it up here. Just link to it because the URL for that content never changes. It's the same page. They change the content. It's there. I have a friend, Tom Tomasek, who does the five loaves. It's a, it's a six-minute, seven-minute video reflection on every Sunday's reading from the Catholic lectionary which on most Sundays is the same as the Revised Common. It's beautiful. There's a song and, you know, contemporary song. The rest, it's well done, free. Lexio Divina from American Bible Society on the Sunday's readings. There's Working Preacher, despite my preacher's. Uh... Now, this would be a subscription, so I only have the example up. So here's content I would buy so I could put it up here. And this is Taking Faith Home. There's lots of things like taking faith home that are, that are basically connecting Sunday to, to the week. But that's my, that's my grow with scripture. I can do all kinds of stuff with that page. That wasn't hard at all to do because I have homegrown content. I have stable content. So how many times do I change this page? Every week I change this. And every week I update this. That's it. The rest stays constant because the content changes, but the, but the URLs don't change. Priestly, now you're thinking to yourself, you should have thought of this. That's what you're thinking right now. I should have thought of this. Service. I don't need to organize service programs. These are adults. They drive. I don't need permission slips or child protection stuff. They're adults. I just kind of set them loose. I don't know why people don't like working with adults. There's just nothing, there's no downside. They have cars, they have money. I don't know, not much, but they have money. No permission slips. No making sure everybody got back on the bus after the trip. What's not to like? So here's an example. So here's a church that selected these action projects. You, by the way, you can do any action project. These are all contextual. Habitat, we have a serve the community a day, support the education of children through donors choose, and assemble promise packs for refugees. Four examples. I could have put a hundred examples on here, right? All of these will be small groups or large groups, depending on it. We can offer adults all those. They can read more about this. I could develop small groups. I could do a presentation. Now, this is up here because I actually wrote that. So I had permission to put it up there. So when you have permission, you do something like this where they can read it right online and download it. So you can embed a video. If they want to learn more about poverty, they can do that. They can watch this wonderful film called The Line. They can see who's poor in every state, county, in the country. Catholic Campaign Human Development has this interactive map. You see where I'm going with this. You can get comprehensive adult faith formation pretty quickly. You've got people in your community right now who are already doing, adults, who are already involved in service. You know, that, you know who they are. So we'll go back to how do I get other people involved? They're already involved. They just didn't realize they were part of your adult faith formation plan. Now you want to break the news. You're part of an adult faith formation plan. So I've got people who are already doing this. And I'll say, would you organize this on a date for our adults in our church? And I'm going to work with them. 
They may never come to a committee meeting. In fact, if you say committee, they may run for the door. These committee is where people go to die. Okay, committees. It's true, isn't it? Committee, oh, no, 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 it's like the plague. Um, I have people working, I would pick these projects based on my community and who's already in place. It's natural service. And the content to help people go deeper is readily available. Done. Boys, because you don't seem to find women on assignments. Yeah, that's um, true. Um, filling the pew. Yeah. With this. Yeah. So the, the, the internal question at churches is how do I get more bodies in the pews? Okay. And get those bodies to fork over cash. So I've got to step back. So I'm going to give a Roman Catholic example. Because the question I always get for Roman Catholic audiences, you're going to guess exactly what it is. How do I get people back to Mass on Sunday? So I want people to just step back and I'll say, it's a long road from not being involved to Mass on Sunday. But there's nowhere in the gospel where I say, where I hear Jesus say, get people to Mass on Sunday. But I did hear at the end of the gospel of Matthew, go to the ends of the world with the good news. If I do that, my people want to check out this church that's doing all these things in the community, in my life, in our world, that I may want to worship with those people. Because the reason people go to worship, they're, 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 things are varied. But one of the biggest ones is hospitality, belonging, and welcome. And now they've got a connection. So the people engaged in service, they come to, they, they have no connection to any church but they just love the fact that we are a church who initiated to serve the community day. And they join with us a day. Well, for a whole day, they're rubbing shoulders with one of the stewards of our community. It's just a stalwart member who's in everything. And all of a sudden, the question goes, well, why do you do this? And all of a sudden, the testimony comes out in story. No hard sell. This is, and I've heard these stories I've heard adults say, this church saved my life. Well, wouldn't you want to check them out one Sunday? See, I want to increase the touch points with people. And I think it's all evangelism, by the way. I think it's all going to the ends of the world. It's, it's, it's a, I want to increase the touch points that might start a conversation between one of those people who are actively engaged and one of those people who are not so sure about this whole church, God, religion thing. Or who comes occasionally and now maybe has a reason to come a little more regularly. So we have to see this as a process and a journey. And my point is, unless you've got an alternative, what do you got to lose? I mean, unless you have another way you're going to import bodies and beam them into the seats on Sunday morning and, and magically open their wallets, then this, is, this, is, this does two things at once. It's great adult faith formation. God would be happy. And it's an invitation to become more actively engaged with us. That's, that's all I would say. And, and, and as... And if they're, if they're all my age, which they probably are if they're on the finance committee or older, what kind of church do you want to leave behind? And what kind of church do you want to leave behind? So I know why you didn't do it in your mock-up page right there, but what does the about us, or how do you make the link between oh, this, which yeah. is not ours, sure. and here we are? Sure. So here... Imagine this on the front page. Let's go back to the front page. And I would, call, I would change the name of Adult Faith Formation. So let's say it's Holy Trinity Adult Faith. Brought to you by the Holy Trinity Faith Community, where everybody is welcome. And then you can do right on the front page. Don't put the picture of the church. Don't put the photo of the church. 
Every Catholic website is a picture of the church. So church is a building, not the people of God. Now, on a Protestant website, they tend to be the pastor and his wife or husband. Now, if that was on a Catholic website, that would draw a lot of attention. <laughs> that might be a good strategy. You know, the pastor with his wife on the front page of a Roman Catholic parish. Think about the possibilities. <laughs> the front page of the website, just like this one, has to be the church alive. That's why I want an adult faith formation website that's not the church website. But I want on the church website, we're moving with adults. We've got things, and then the link. And then on this, this is brought to you by this church, and we're really committed to this. So give me a paragraph that's how you're really committed to this. And you might be interested in our church. So you don't see a worship schedule on here. Not that I'm amen uh, not amenable to that. It's just that I want to get you to the church website where the worship schedule is, where there's a letter from the pastor who says, welcome to our community. We're open to everyone. We want to welcome you. Yeah, you're, you're, yeah, it's okay. It's big, and you don't need to be this big. That's why I've done this, not as a church site. People say, do I have to have all that? No, you grow into this. If you, over three seasons, imagine yourself growing into this, a year, the question is, where do you want to be a year from now? Because the bar for adult faith formation is really low. It's not like you have to meet other, these, all these expectations. I mean, like people are going to go, oh, that's different. Yeah, it's different. Unless you happen to be unfortunately next to a big non-denominational church which has this big, you know, adult faith. Rate. But even they, they tend to focus more on children and teens than even adults. Same thing. Okay. Does that, does that feel good? All the way back. Yeah, um, in a couple of ways. So how do, how do we integrate this with non-digital seniors? Um, there can, I mean, let's see how I can do it this way. If I have gatherings of my non-digital seniors, so let, they're mobile, they gather, um, I would use digital content like this in my programming, okay? A lot of them have, iPads hanging around because the kids gave them one for Christmas. Or they're in a nursing home that has Wi-Fi. Every nursing home now has Wi-Fi. Think about that for a minute. Churches don't, but nursing homes do. The, the paradoxes in, uh, in life are just endless. Um, so one church recognized the fact that seniors have a lot of these technologies or even like in a nursing home, have access to a computer, but don't know how to use it. So they did App Sunday, APP Sunday, in which the middle school and high school kids, after Sunday worship, did a clinic for older adults, one-on-one. -on -one. So it was, I call it reverse mentoring, okay? Teaching them how to use these gadgets. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of seniors, especially older ones, go to like a senior center in town or something like that, or libraries, all connected. Church is not connected, senior center connected, all right? Um, we have to just show them different places where they can access this. And also, we can print things that are printable. And no problem, I mean, there's, we're always gonna be print, audio, video, digital, we're always gonna have all those. And so you contextualize this for your people so that there's no barriers to access. But I'm simply amazed for these my mother-in-law is 95, she's in a nursing home now. She has my iPad, there's only two things on it, the settings, what you have, you can't delete that. And her, oh, two, three things, her Kindle app and her Audible app. Now, her eyesight, not so good, and her hearing, not so good. But when you put the headphones on, pretty good. So she reads books, I mean, we're talking about a book or two a week. 
She's 95 years old. She's in a nursing home. They have Wi-Fi. In fact, they have really high-speed Wi-Fi. Pretty remarkable. So it's, it's, she wouldn't buy the device, but it was given to her. And once you set it up, she's good to go. And we said, Mom, don't touch anything else. <laughs> the Kindle thing and the orange Audible thing, that's all you touch. Touch nothing. We even put the other stuff on a different screen, so you've got to slide around and find it, right? Yeah. right? But, and every now and then she does, and we have to reset it, you know. But my wife's able to upload new books from her computer to, to our iPad. So she has a constant library of stuff. She's 95 years old. She grew up on a farm in Virginia Lakes, Minnesota. She's using an iPad. So, but it's just, it's closing the barrier though. It's not about gadgets. It's just closing the confidence. Once she's confident, she's good to go. Uh, question that the lady down in the end had was an interesting one. But I like to turn it around a little bit. You, you have a growing church that fills the pews. Yeah, growing church filling pews. They come in and they hear the pastor. And then they walk out the door. It's great to have this. This is all great. Right. But how do you stop? If I got in the church and I got a, a, a pastor who's getting in there, he's my, or she's my promo person. You got a screen? Guess what's on the screen? And so at the end of the worship service, not in the middle, this is what's, this is what I have available this week for Sunday worship. Take it home with you. Or this week, we, you know, we, this was the sermon this week, and we've got things... We want you to engage with us around service. So he, he or she from the pulpit is your connector. And so what I want to do is I want to expand people's engagement and use worship as the catalyst for that and see where that takes you and then grow it accordingly. You might think about the year the way uh, Round Hill Community Church did with a theme each month, and I'll show you. So you can go a very, you can go a different direction. There's, I mean, the possibilities. I guess you're getting the getting the part of it. Possibilities are endless. So I designed a little prototype site for them. Their year is called Life Worth Living, okay. and that's their first four months. Yeah, you, you, you can't use the artwork. It's Brother Mickey McGrath's, so, but it's beautiful artwork. And so Sunday worship, they would, put, they would fill this in every week. But then I just gave them one page, and it happened, I just, for our purpose, I did adults. So September, a month of grad. So they're coming to worship, and now we want to extend it all month long. So things to learn. Want to be happy, be great. Brother David Steinerest did this TED Talk that is, have, have, any, have you seen this? If you haven't, just Google TED, brother. It's, just, it's stunning about gratitude. If you want to be happy, be grateful. Okay. Brother David Steinerest. Thank you. That, uh, well, it's too long. I can never, just Brother David TED Talk. He'll be, he's the only brother who's ever given a TED Talk. I'm certain of it. All right. So that's a video. Then the, the Society of St. John the Evangelist. Many of you are familiar with it. Brother Curtis did one on gratitude, living life as a gift. So these videos are not on the site. They're in YouTube, but they're playing here. Then I did prayer. I said, how are we going to pray gratitude this month? And I had a psalm each week. And then what do you want to read about gratitude? I had a one wonderful article and this great book that they could purchase if they want to. They're adults, they can do this, they have money. And they have an Amazon account. And then live. So if I had worship, I, why not start there? I, I, whatever door you go in, it doesn't make any difference. It's the fact that you're doing what? I have a, an embracing community 
and spiritually hungry adults, and now I can build out from that. Or I have adults who are at worship, but maybe not so hungry, and I want to build on that. It's still the same kind of composite. The community wants to make things happen. Does that help? We have, yeah, please. priest at our church as a certain way to approach it. And I can see a sort of who's supposed to design the website. And right. I can see a sort of barrier of intimidation. I was a pastor. Oh, he's okay. He's young enough, but I can see it a lot of different churches. So I went to a workshop with this old 66 year old guy who was showing us websites he designed. I'm sure we could do better than him. And then let me show you the website. People might say it to you because you're younger. People don't usually say it to me. <laughs> but that's what you want to say. It's no longer a barrier. So a lot of these sites like Weebly, uh, Squarespace, Wix, are, are what's called, um, I don't describe it. They're really drag and drop website builders. WordPress is kind of for the advanced crowd, okay? Weebly is W-E-E-B-L-Y. Wix, W-I-X, and Squarespace are wonderful sites to build a website. So really anybody can have a website today. So I don't think building it, by the way, it's like when, when somebody at a church says, oh, how would you ever get a Facebook page? I said, well, how many people in your church are on Facebook? You, you just draw the talents out from the community. So even on a website, the last people who should be designing it are the staff. They haven't got time. Get some people from the community who can help you with that. And these website builders are really easy to use. I mean, and they're inexpensive. For about $100 a year, you could set it up, they'll host you. It's pretty much it. When you think about what we spent on church bulletins, this is a bargain. Uh, this is just a practice one. I do a lot of practice websites. They are going. No, but it's going to. What, what I, I did workshops with them. The last one I did was, in, was last month in May, and we, I previewed this with them. They're going to redesign their – so bookmark Roundhill. They're going to uh, – do, don't look at my address because that's just on Weebly. So, but Roundhill is going to have a new church, new website, September 1st. It may not look just like this, but they're building a whole new one on WordPress with all this content. Ronald Community Church, Greenwich, Connecticut. Yeah, Greenwich, Connecticut. Okay, so uh, let's go. Got a couple more minutes. Let's finish. John. Yep. Got sure. Uh, the 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 question is how how do you approach uh, youth and children sites as well as this, and do you have um, these things attached directly to the main website. Uh, I've got examples of those. So if that person even wanted to just email me, I could send them examples. Um, the, the children's site would be a children and families site. So like when I'm doing the families workshop this week, I'll have, the, I'll have one you can, you can access. It's simply called familiesatthecenter.com. Just like Seasons of Adult Faith, it's for families. So um, to the person who asked the question online, familiesatthecenter.com is an example of, of, of this kind of website with families. Teenagers, they have to build it with you. I mean, the last thing you want is an old guy building a teenage website, you really, you know. So if you're going to build a website or some kind of social media platform that delivers content, not just a Facebook kind of thing, they have to be engaged. And the same would be true for young adults. So for midlife and older, I think my example holds up, but I want to get the 20 and 30 somethings engaged with me. They'd actually build it, but I might actually curate the content with them. So it has the, it's got to have a look and feel of the people you're trying to serve. So when you actually build it, you have to ask the question, if I was that age, would this style, photos and the rest be attractive? And obviously when you're building a, a website, you want photos of your community, of your people, not I stock photos, okay? Um, so you want to be able to generate those. 
It's got to have a look and feel of the target audience that you're going to direct it towards. And that's easy. You know, everyone takes photographs today. Think Instagram. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm going to wrap up with scenario three and four, and then there's more content that you can do. People ask me all the time, what do you do if I'm in a church that's resisting and I have adults who don't really care? So, and it's never all adults. Okay. So here's strategy one, and you'll, there's more of these are in this, the booklet that came out of the scenario that, of, this, of the uh, fall conference I did. We do have grandparents on Sunday. They come to church. They can be faith formers of their grandchildren. Very few churches have seized that opportunity, by the way. So, you, so rather than do adult faith formation for them, Teach them how to be faith formers of their grandchildren. When you go to the Families of the Center website, you'll see all kinds of content for them, whether their kids are next door or their kids are a distance. So it's a natural. It just works. Um, mature adults, boomers and builders, you probably have more of those in terms of the adult cycle. So just focus on them. So people say, well, how, do you, how do I work with those who aren't coming? You're not a church that's going to work with those who aren't coming right now. In fact, you're kind of hostile to the ones who aren't coming. You don't like the ones who are not coming. So don't work with the ones who are not coming. It's kind of like, this, this is very cheap therapy, by the way. All right, so, um, so instead, focus on those who are. Build a website just for mature, and, and it and looks a little more traditional. That's OK. Milestone celebrations of adulthood, retirement, Things that are more public, people might be more life-centered. So milestones, retirement, selling the home, um, sending off the children to college, becoming an empty nest household. Those can be celebrated in the community. And you can start doing adult faith formation around milestones. Great website to go to is milestonesministry.org. Milestonesministry.org. They have a whole series of adult web, adult. Uh, ones. I work with a lot of churches that can't jumpstart adult faith formation, but they're doing intergenerational faith formation with an adult component. So two communities away from me, Sacred Heart Church in Southbury, Connecticut, does intergenerational, they're a big church, they do inter inter intergenerational learning, uh, I believe five or six months of the year. They're the largest adult education program in the country. Is about 1,500 to 2,000 adults come every month for the adult piece of intergenerational learning. It's huge. But if you start an adult faith formation, they might say, eh, but you're coming for the kids and all the generations together. It's a church festival, which has an adult faith formation piece built in. So those are just some examples. And then if you're in a church which wants to engage and embrace, then you're really thinking about how to be missional. So adult faith formation in cafes and homes and community centers, adult faith formation on the go, you've seen a lot of that online stuff, more life-centered around life issues, more public approach, and then community events with spiritual themes. So no matter where your church is and where the adults are, there's things you can do. All of them are really helped by having a digitally enabled and digitally connected approach. How you doing? It's really possible. And I'm watching churches walk down this road, slowly, but building it. So the question you want to take home with you is, where do I want to be a year from now? And just start building it. You've got people back home who can work with you. So I'll close with this story. There's some books up here. I have little, there's little things about the books. And when you go online to Lifelong Faith, it says you could, you know, for the presentations, you could join the mailing list if you want. Just click, fill it in. You'll be on the mailing list. You'll never get anything in the mail. You'll get it by email a couple of times a month at most. So closing story, just to kind of, you know, give you some inspiration to go back home and find the people who can work with you. Everybody remembers the movie The American President with Michael Douglas. Great, wonderful movie. The precursor to The West Wing. Well, one of the subtexts in the movie is 
Michael Douglas tries to give a net bending roses throughout the whole movie. And, so, and, and is miserable at it. He doesn't have money. The floor shop doesn't, rec doesn't recognize he's the president, et cetera, et cetera. But the end of the movie, he succeeds in giving her roses as they're coming kind of down the stairs of the White House. And, and, and she just starts laughing at him. And she says, how did the most powerful person in the free world figure out how to give me roses? And he very sheepishly says, well, I figured out that I had a garden, a rose garden. Take out rose garden and put faith community in. And everyone here has got a faith community of varied gifts and talents and interest and time. Bring out those gifts and talents to really reimagine adult faith formation. There are people who will be your social media people, your website people, your content creators and the rest. Just broaden that out. People are waiting for us to, uh, to respond. No, I don't have any doubt about that. And yes, there are some communities in my resisting and decreasing, but even there you can do something. I'll be around all three days. If you have questions, the rest just pull me aside and be happy to help you. I hope this kind of gets you launched a little bit with some ideas. Go on the website, grab some stuff. It's all available. Thank you. Oh, the books are...